All right, greetings everyone. Again, my name is Brian Schrader. I'm a member of the East Texas uh, area Turners out of Tyler. Uh, uh, up until 11 weeks ago, I was employed and uh, the company decided that they didn't need my services anymore. So I've been practicing for 11 weeks. So uh, uh, quit shaving uh, and uh, started wood turning a little bit more. I'm going to show you some things that I've learned. I've been experimenting with. Uh, I have not been turning very long. Uh, this September will be my third anniversary in wood turning. So I am not the person that you want to follow when it comes to proper sharpening of your tools, proper riding the bevel, uh, proper tool use. I'm more of a geometry experimentation nerd, okay? So I play with a lot of stuff, and tonight I want to talk to you about six-pointed vessels, three-pointed vessels, and six-pointed vessels. This is an intermittent-type cutting. If you've ever done any type of live-edge turning, uh, this is this is intermittent turning where you're turning a lot of air. That's what you're going to be doing in a three and six pointed vessel type turn. So you know how do we do this and what do we do? Uh, we do a couple things. Well, I'm going to talk to you tonight about how we prepare the cube, how we're going to size the cube, some of the design considerations we're going to go into, how we chuck that cube. And then we're going to make some chips, okay? So first thing we need to do is prepare the cube. How many has seen a square tree? Doesn't usually happen, okay? So you got to take a round, you got to take a log, and you've got to turn it into a cube to make this work. Now that sometimes is a little difficult and takes a little bit of practice. And the first thing you need to do, I do this on a bandsaw, and this is a good time to tune up your bandsaw. You need your blade perpendicular to your bed. You need your ways straight and smooth. If you haven't done this recently, I recommend you search in YouTube for Alex Snodgrass. He, has a, he works for Carter Products. Uh, he doesn't necessarily try to sell Carter Products on the website. But he does give you some good techniques of how to set your bandsaw up so that your blade is running vertical, true, and square. I started running these blocks, and every time I ran a block, I got a, I got a curve cut. Either I got, a, I got a cup cut or I got a bowed cut. And I kept tightening the belt because I knew the belt had to be tight to make it that straight cut. What I found out was the tighter you make the belt, the more susceptible it is to take its own path or take the easiest grain through the wood. So I backed up, I went and did some research. Alex was a really good source, all right? So uh, one of the things we're gonna have to do in this operation, I built a sled, real easy little sled, a, uh, Guide on the bottom fits in my fits in my uh, bandsaw. sits on the sits on the table. sits in the miter way, and I clamp a stop to it. And first thing I do is I try to true up three edges. Real easy to trim up three edges. Okay, here's my here's my sample block. All right. First thing I do, just take it and I rip it through one edge. Next thing I do is I put that cut edge down on the table and I rip the second edge. I now have two edges that are perpendicular to each other. I take that, that edge that's square and the other edge is square. I turn it and put it, put one edge against my square and I rip the third edge. I now have three edges that are square to each other trick is how do you get the other six sides of that cube square and perpendicular to each other. So for anybody that's an engineer and you've ever done right hand rule and you've done X cross Y cross Z to get right hand rule. Uh, again, I'm kind of an engineer and I'm a trained, uh, trained engineer. And in an aircraft sense, you have pitch, you have roll, and you have yaw. Any two axes of that will put you square. If I take those three corners, I put one of the flat sides down 
against my, the bed of my tool. I put one of those sides back against my fence, and I put the other edge against the stop. I'm now referenced off this edge, this edge, and the bottom edge. I want to cut these other three sides. I set that block, put it up against my stop, and I rip that edge. If I do two turns, one pitch, one roll, I have another side. Two turns, one pitch, one roll, I have the other side. Pitch, roll. Okay? You don't like pitch and roll? Do roll and y'all. Roll and y'all. You don't like roll and y'all? Do y'all and pitch. Y'all and pitch. Okay? You're always going to have... You're always going to be coming back to this reference side. You're always going to be putting the one reference against the table, one reference against your fence, and one reference against your stop. Okay? That's how you get a cube. So there's our pitch roll and y'all. Okay, now how big of a cube do I want to make? Who's got a 16-inch way lathe? Who can turn a 16-inch bowl? Okay, you're going to cut a 16-inch cube, aren't you? No, because we're not cut, we're not turning about this edge. We're going to be turning about the corners. So we've got to remember where those corners go. So in order to do that, we sh I'm going to start with a 9-inch cube. It's going to spin about the corners, so that's going to spin an equilateral triangle, 12 inches on the length of the triangle, that's going to be 14, nearly 14 and 3 quarter inches on the diameter that it sweeps. So I use roughly a 9 16 rule. If I've got a 16 inch way on my lathe, I'm not going to cut a block any larger than 9 inches. If you cut a block longer than 9 inches, your ways are going to get in your way. You cut a too big of a block, you're going to start moving the banjo. You're going, to, you're going to clip those delicate wings off of your block. It starts to get kind of frustrated, okay? I do want to back up just a little bit and tell you folks that I am using you as a guinea pig. Uh, I, you've talked about SWAT. I am going to be one of the regional demonstrators at SWAT this year. I'm going to be giving basically the same uh, six-pointed vessel talk at SWAT. So if you like it tonight, you don't have to come see it again at SWAT. Okay? If you don't like it tonight, please tell me you didn't like it. Tell me what you didn't like about it, okay? Was I too loud? Was I too soft? Was I, did I leave you hanging on too many subjects? Did you not understand how you cut the block? Why did I bring up pitch rolling, y'all? Why did I even talk about aircraft, okay? So if there's something you don't like, let me know, okay? The three for one. Uh, we talked about three for one. Uh, I think your club has probably been asked to donate objects for the three for one raffle. Our club has been asked to donate for three for one raffle. I'm going to be donating one of the six point vessels for a three for one raffle. So you have a chance to win uh, one of these. So I hope to see you at SWAT. I hope to see you in our sessions. I hope that I'm in the big room with the hunt group because I love your, uh, I love your lighting. I love your setup. So, uh, George, Donna, if you guys got any pull and you get me in your room, uh, do that, okay? So uh, uh, now that we know how big of a block we want to turn, let's talk about some design considerations. What do we want to do? How, what do we want to turn this block into? Okay? Well, we've got to keep in mind that when we look at this block, we're going to see... If I hold it just right, and not everybody's going to be able to see this just right, but I'm going to see two sides. I see this side, and I see this side. And we're going to spin about this axis. So we're going to spin this block, and we're going to end up seeing all six sides of this cube at some time. So when I set this up and I start spinning, I start to spin it, I get a shape on the lathe with the phantom images, the ghost images, that look something like this. I don't know if you can see the red lines, but you can, if, if you look close, you can see two horizontal red lines, which is where the points are spinning. This is what we're doing. 
And that shape looks very similar to that shape that was on the, on the detail. Now, this point is over here in this turn. It moves away from me, and it ends up over here in the next turn. So if you look at this slide, that dark area is going to be effectively solid wood. Everything outside of that diamond is the wings, it's going to be the points, it's going to be the intermittent cut. You're going to be cutting air one-third of the time when you're cutting in that white area. When you're in the blue area, when you finally get down to the blue area, you'll be making full engagement with the wood at all times. So, one of the easiest things to do, and if you look on the internet, one of the things that they show most often is you'll find three-sided bowls. That's, that's a simple three-sided cut. I've removed three of the points and left three of the points. I still have the chuck, the tenon on the bottom. This is made out of cherry. Cherry's a hard wood. Hard woods are going to give you a lot of chip out, a lot of tear out on that. Corey, pass that around if you want, okay? Same thing, three-pointed vessel. This one has feet on the bottom. I've cut the tenon away. I've put feet on it. This is holly. This is a much more ductile wood. It's not nearly as brittle, not nearly as hard. Finished out great. Didn't give me a lot of tear out on the corners. Uh, when you start using a hardwood and you're trying to do these, these corners and to chip out, CA becomes your friend, okay? All right, so there's other ways of doing this. Uh, on this particular block, as I started spinning it, rather than taking the, the bottom three points off and leaving only the top three, I cut the top half of the block off, and I only used the bottom of the block and found some interesting ways to chuck it so I could get rid of the tenon on the bottom and made just a, a gadget, okay? Uh, little artsy, crafty ways of doing it. Again, I'm talking about design considerations. What do you want your article to look like when you finish? What do you, you know, how do you want to go with this? So, uh, still on the three, three winged vessels, I didn't want to make just a vase. I wanted to make a hollow form. So I made a hollow form. Nice and tight lid. Made a hollow form, thought it was great, took it in the house, showed a friend. I was talking about how I had, you know, three points spinning out here and there, and I cut three points off, and I made this hollow form and hollowed it out, made it real nice. And the guy that I thought was my friend looked at me, and he says, well, if you cut three points off, and left three points, what if you didn't cut any points off? You made it a six-point vessel. So, back to the drawing board. <clears throat> so, I went back to the lathe, got me another piece of wood, and I experimented. And this one, I've not found a lot of videos in YouTube. Why? Because I think people have a tendency to shy away from putting their hand into a turning buzzsaw. It is a bit delicate, okay? But, uh, you know, these are basically the same wood. I forgot what these even are. I think I've got it on the bottom. Uh, maple. These came off the same block of maple. And uh, same size uh, blanks when they started. Three-point, six-point hollow forms. Okay. Going back to the three-point, well, let's go to the uh, let's go to the slide. Just a simple three-wing vessel. I'm gonna cut three. I'm gonna cut the the bottom three points off. I'm gonna leave the top three points, just like that holly piece that's going around. Okay, but you can play with the profile. You don't necessarily have to follow the flat facets of the face. That's what I did here. I put more of an OG shape on the, on the bowl. Gave the wing a little bit of a flare, okay? 
and put a little finial lid on it, okay? Um, I'll leave the finial up here. That's a little delicate, okay? So. <laughs> okay, so again, going back to, uh, you know, that, that's not just true on the three-pointed vessel, but on the six-pointed vessel. You can play with how you roll those edges, how you roll those wings, how you roll those, the, the points, okay? Uh, I actually, the point would have been sticking out here. I actually, you know, did more of a cove or a, a bead shape to it and, and hollowed the inside. And uh, uh, then I got to a point, I was like, hmm, how am I going to get the tenon off of it? And I, I had to finally just hand carve the tenon to make a little candle holder out of it. So, uh, uh uh, Box Elder, uh, compliments of George Freeman. Thank you very much, George. And I have made mistakes, okay? This is what I call my I laid an egg uh, opportunity. I started turning this. Uh, I had six points on it. My neighbor walked in behind me and said something. And I was starting to move this way with my chisel, and all six points were the same size. And I got a little tight over here, and I heard tick, 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 tick. And I, well, I actually turned the other way. I was, I was getting into these points, and so I jumped back over, and I just ran my chisel, my gouge, and I broke two of my points off. So rather than having six equal points, I had three points and three feet. Then when I turned it around and chucked it into, my, into the tenon and started hollowing it, I started hollowing and I realized I had daylight showing through on one side. Somehow when I moved it from a forward to a reverse position and I, start, I finished the outside and I started hollowing the outside, the part shifted in the tenon just a little bit. So I have a thick wall moderately thick wall on one side and I had air on the other so I said well since I laid an egg on that one I just made it the egg bowl and uh, uh, cut some of the wings away and you know I, I bring this it's not really a demo piece it's not a piece I'm real proud of but it's to show you that uh, you can make mistakes and I could have carved two grooves in it and called it an ashtray but uh, I just played with it. I decided that I was, I was playing with my skew. I decided to cut uh, an egg with the skew and then not had anything to do with the egg. So I, I used it as a plug. So uh, that's what that is. So, all right. So six pointed vessels, again, we're just, uh, we're just trying to cut away uh, the leftover, the material and leave ourselves uh, the six points. For another demonstration, here's a cube with a tennis ball put in the center. The, 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 the tennis ball basically represents the solid wood. And I've got three black points. I've got three white points. And the green points basically are going to be the axis of spin. So if you want to kind of visualize, what is this guy talking to us about? Take this, hold the green, the green beads spin it, and you can see how this shape develops, okay? All right, so what's next? The, uh, this slide is a six-pointed vessel, and the difference in the six-pointed vessels, the vessel, I, the vessel I first showed actually has a rounded bottom. Okay, so it will actually sit on the bottom of the rounded vessel. This one, I've actually made the entire bottom concave, so when it sits down, it sits only on the wings. So again, design considerations. How big do I make the body? How, how much does the body protrude down? Uh, do, I, do I make the body shallow so that the wings are the accent points or the feet, okay? All of these are design considerations that you want to think about. 
I'll be honest, most of them I've thought about is as I start cutting with my gouge and I get a catch and I get a big, big oops and I go, hmm, how am I going to clean that up? Well, I'm going to clean it up by making the bottom concave and it sit on the feet, right? So uh, uh, that again is box elder. Okay. So... The things you can do with turning a cube into a three six-pointed vessel is limited only by your imagination, okay? So start playing, start cutting chips, keep your fingers out of the way, and uh, let's next go to chucking options, and let's talk about making some chips. So I think with that, I am done with the PowerPoint. <laughs> These blocks have all been, um, again, sometimes it's hard to find a block of wood or a chunk of wood that is large enough to build a cube out of. And I'm missing a cube. There it is. Again, I cut this on my bandsaw, but there are ways to get around if you can't find a piece of wood, you make it. Okay, this is some oak scrap that uh, I just machined down. I ran it on my planer. Uh, it's basically nine inches long, three inches wide, inch and a half thick. Stack up a bunch of layers, glue them all together. Come out with something like this. Okay. Now, I had some problems gluing this together. Anybody tried to glue that many layers together and not get any cracks, get any, get any voids, get any seams? So this one has a lot of filler. That's uh, pony beads, plastic filler. Uh, it's kind of a faux turquoise color that I try to put in there. Uh, this one was where I learned the hard way what the largest block I could turn. That started out as a nine inch cube. When you put a nine inch cube up here, those points come real close to your ways. And you, so you gotta be careful and you turn, you turn this so that this edge is parallel to the ways so you can move the banjo. And as you move the banjo, you forget and you knock this point off. I've done it, okay? As I move the banjo, I heard this tink. I went, oh. I know what that was. So I get CA glue out and I glue the tips back on. So uh, uh, again, be careful when you're making the, uh, when you're making your block, when you're sizing your block, start small. No, don't start small, start medium, okay? And I'm gonna tell you why here in just a minute, why you don't wanna start small, but I've just told you why you don't wanna start large, okay? Chucking the block. Several ways to do this. Some people will want to try to get fancy and they'll want to put it on their miter saw, set the, set the table on the miter saw to 45 degrees, set the compound miter to 37 and a half or whatever the proper angle is, and slice this off so that you get exactly a one inch cut on all sides. It leaves you a flat face. You can then mark that face and put your, put your, uh, uh, pointed drive in it, your spur drive, and put your pointed center on the other end. I do not recommend it. It's too hard to try to find the center once you've taken that, once you've taken that point off, okay? Don't recommend it. Very easy way, put it in the open, open spindle. Bring your live center up. I have the point of the cube is actually in the open spindle. No, good point. I have removed in my live center, I have taken the point out of my live center. So it's just a hollow circle, okay? 
Excellent catch. Thank you, Rhonda. Did everybody hear the question? She asked if the point was still in here. Again, one of the techniques I'm working on. When the question comes from the floor, repeat the question so all can hear. Okay, so I'm now in the hollow center on both. I don't have a lot of, a lot of pressure on this just yet. And I'll tell you why. The closer you can get the block to perfectly square, and the closer you can truly square the block once you chuck it, the more balanced your points are going to be. If you don't balance your points, you're going to have one long point and two short ones, or two long ones and one short one. Or they're going to be out of plane. They're going to be out of, out of tilt. So we can go to the overhead. I'm setting the edge of my tool rest even with that point, even with one of the points. And I'm going to slowly turn and see how much difference I get as I turn that block to see how much difference I get. Now, the closer I, I get it to square, the better chance I have of all the points lining up. And you can see this point lines up pretty close. That point lines up pretty close. This point's pretty close. Now, at this point, I still have a little bit of play in the spindle. And I can move that around just a little bit and try to, try to fine-tune that before I crank this down tight. And then I'm going to check it one more time. Pretty good. Close enough, okay? Now... One of the nice things about this type of block versus intermittent turning, who's ever turned a live edge? Who's ever turned a log off center? You get a lot of wop wop, wop wop, wop wop, a lot of off center, right? You got a lot of off center mass. If you've got a fairly solid block that doesn't have a lot of pithy wood, that oak that I'm showing around, that, that, that's my, I laid an egg bowl, a lot of pithy wood, a lot of hard wood. It was very off center. Yeah, I, I could I couldn't run a lot of speed on the RPM. I would get in a lot of wobble, a lot of vibration. Okay, if you've got a fairly uniform block that's pretty much uniform density, you can run this thing pretty fast. Okay, and you want to run it fast. You're run you're doing an intermittent cut. You want to run anything that's intermittent. You want to try to get the velocity up as high as you can, so that the time your tool is in the air is minimized. That's 1100 RPM. And very little vibration. Okay. That's one way to chuck it, okay? You're going to have to cut a tenon on this at some point, whether it be a positive tenon or a reverse mortise. You're going to have to be able to move the headstock away to be able to do the hollowing process to get the, the vase or the hollowing out of it. Okay, so I've shown you a real quick way to do it. I'm going to do a little bit different method. Who's ever used rubber chuckies? If you've never used rubber chuckies, I've got some business cards up here from rubber chucky, uh, Mr. Don Doyle. He's out of where? Minnesota, Michigan. Uh, has all sorts of uh, uh, jam chucks and other types of products. Well, uh, last October I gave this demonstration and the week after I gave the demonstration, I got an email from Rubber Chucky that they came out with a three-point Chucky. Okay? 
I was thinking about making one. I was going to, you know, take me a piece of oak or mesquite or something, and I was going to mill it down, machine it, and make my own. Well, lo and behold, he's come up with a, a gadget, three-point chucky. Now, a three-point chucky is nice. It does have some limitations. A minute ago, I showed you how with the play inside this hollow stock, I can move this block around and I can balance those points. When I go to the rubber chucky, I've lost that degree of freedom, okay? But it has some other nice features to it. Um, one of the nice things about the, uh, when you run the spindle, here's, you ready for the lie? You never get a catch. When you get a catch, it stops the block. Okay, you don't have enough friction, especially if your spindles and your uh, if your spindles got uh, unless it's really been beat up and you've been taking a hammer to it to get your your uh, one way jaws or something off of it. It does not have enough friction. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can put your hand on the block when it's turning and it's going to spin inside this spindle. Okay, you get a catch. It's going to stop. It's not going to. Uh, Tend, tend to throw the block off. Uh, with the rubber chucky, you've got more, you've got more positive engagement. Uh, you will, you know, get a catch or can uh, get a pretty good, pretty good gouge on it. The other thing about uh, the the thing I do like about these rubber chuckies, that's a 50 millimeter diameter right there. And I'm trying to put this into a 50 millimeter one-way chuck. So all I've got to really do is just kind of follow that edge to develop my tenon. And um, you'll see here in a little bit that as you start working on this, as you start working on the tenon, you're going to have a lot of material out here that will not fit into your jaws. So at some point, you're going to have to come in with your parting tool or your saw, and you're going to have to cut this point off for it to be able to fit into the jaws of the chuck. Nothing more frustrating than cutting that and not cutting deep enough into this block and giving yourself enough diameter. Cutting that point off, putting it in the jaws of your chuck, and it just spins. Now what do you do? Now you do have to try to figure out how to put a spur center or a spur drive or something onto that point and get it spinning concentric for you again, all right? So, let's cut some chips. They told me that you could hear me when I put the mash down. Can you hear me? Good. I can see heads nodding, but I can't hear you, so... Twelve fifty RPM. What was the question again? Not much. It's a it's a pretty dense polyurethane. He was asking how much give. How much elasticity, how much cushion? It's a, it's a pretty high modulus polyurethane of some grade that uh, it doesn't give you much, okay? This is a nice project to do on a hot summer afternoon is when you start it's it kind of gives you kind of a self-cooling gives you a little air a little breeze okay i'm using a 5 8 inch uh, bowl gouge with an ellsworth grind on it uh nothing magic about that that was just uh, uh the grind that was on this chisel when i acquired it i'm running 1340 rpm
And so you can see I've gone already the distance that's inside the inside the rubber chucky. You can see how far I've gone into that part and I still don't have a continuous circle. If I want to go in this way, I can get that circle to close much quicker, but then I have too small of a tenon to fit into my chuck. You'll make that mistake. Mistake, mistake is a wonderful teacher, or experience is a wonderful teacher. It allows you to recognize a mistake when you make it again. I've got a little bit smaller gouge. This is mango. I was on a project in Hawaii in December and I called the Honolulu wood turners. And this is what I love about wood turning. Uh, when I was in the uh, business in defense contracting, everything was tight to the chest. Every drawing had a proprietary note on it, uh, intellectual property, uh, confidentiality, do not share, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Wood turners is one of the only professions I've ever found that people have been, come on in, I'll show you how I did that, you know? And I love that about this, uh, about this, this organization and this uh, hobby, okay? So I called the Honolulu wood turners, told them I was from East Texas, and they had woods that I've never seen, never heard of, and uh, they did just that. They said, not a problem. I'll send your email out. And within 24 hours, I had three other members calling me, asking me what part of the island I was on, come by and see them. I brought home 350 pounds of wood from Hawaii. The customs guys are still trying to find me, okay? So <laughs> uh, Donna told, uh, announced that I am from Longview. I don't know if you saw the news. We, had, we got hit by a tornado uh, yesterday. I've had no electricity since two o'clock yesterday. Two o'clock yesterday afternoon, I had two pines, two oaks, one elm uh, come down in my backyard. The path of that tornado went within 30 feet of the eve of my house. And I am very glad to be here tonight. So I live in North Longview, but I think it went from north to south. It, it, uh, uh, and it was it was pretty scary there for a little bit. So, George, bring your tractor, bring your truck. Uh, you can have uh, I know you can haul the pine if you want, but uh, there's some other woods there too. And uh, there's going to be plenty of road wood. That's wood that's out stacked by the road uh, available for anybody that wants to drive through Longview anytime in the next uh, couple weeks. So. I'm just using a skew to give myself a, a good uh, uh, root to the tenon. I'm going to put, I'm going to uh, start uh, a little bit of a cutoff. I'm going to take my, uh, uh, if I brought it, my cutoff tool and my saw and, uh, and cut this tenon.
Count your fingers before you start, count your fingers after you end. We've got our tenon just about done. No. I could have, yes, I could have. Okay, I told you don't start with a block too small. I've already lost that much. That's to get to a 50 millimeter diameter chuck. I've lost that much, okay? So if you make the block too small, you're gonna lose, again, that much of the block, okay? So start with the largest block as you feel comfortable with, but don't go too small or you'll be fighting it, okay? Now, some people want to make Christmas ornaments. They don't want the Christmas ornaments to be huge and gaudy, so you want a block probably a little smaller than this, but you may want to use something smaller than a 50-millimeter jaw uh, when you do it, okay? Any questions, comments? Yes, do the exact same, the, the question was, if I'm not using the rubber chucky, do I do the same process of, of cut, sizing and cutting the tenons? Is that, that the proper interpretation of the question? Answer is yes. I just use the rubber chucky because it gives me a good pilot to follow to be able to gauge how big the tenon needs to be. If I have the spindle out here, you see that spindle is only a one inch spindle and I'm trying to put a two inch uh, uh, tenon on it, it's harder to gauge. And you'll tend to trim this off too short and then it won't fit in your tenon, okay? And once you've trimmed, once you've trimmed that off, that point right there is my reference of my axis. I've lost it, okay? I've transferred it now to the OD of the tenon. But if I cut that off prematurely, I've lost that reference, okay? And I've got to go to my smaller chuck, whatever. For this size block, I could probably use a smaller chuck. Uh, when I'm going to a block this big, I don't feel comfortable running uh, smaller than a 50 millimeter jaw. I may even go to my 100, okay? George, Donna, is there a tool for uh, locking the... Uh, I need to get that rubber chucky off my uh, live center. Yeah, and the rubber chuckies come in, uh, yes, you buy them in pairs, and you can buy it with or without the mandrel, okay? There's the, there's with the mandrel on it, and he sells a uh, Morse taper mandrel to go with it okay he makes rubber chuckies in all sorts of shapes sizes kits uh, cones 
truncated cones, hollow cones, uh, make real good jam chucks, uh, real good uh, friction fits. Uh, we will use one of those later. Okay. How are we doing time-wise? Ah, a clock. An analog clock. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and I told you I was uh, glad to be here tonight. I really am. Uh, on the way over, we, uh, we moved to Frisco this afternoon. We cleaned out our, our refrigerator, threw everything in an ice chest, and went to my son's house in Frisco and drove over 380. And on the way over, uh, as we got on the highway and got up to 75, a, a pack of feral hogs ran out in front of me, and I hit one of them. So, you know, I drug him off the road and got back in the car, checked for damage. And uh, I got over here and I started unloading the gear and the game warden pulled in behind me. One of the pigs squealed. <laughs> All right, so I've removed the rubber chuckies. I've crammed the block into the jaws. I brought the tail stock up to make certain I had good flush fit against the jaws, and I should be ready to go. Okay, first thing we're going to do, we're going to run, um, I'm going to give you a three-sided bowl, or at least we're going to start a three-sided bowl. Um, uh, as a demonstrator, I'm trying to show you how this is done. I'm not necessarily trying to finish it for you. So we're going to go through taking off three points, leaving three points. We're going to move the tailstock back, and we're going to start hollowing the center and show you how this shape begins to develop. I have found that you have to have the O-F-F-O-N indicator in the right position for the machine to turn. So we're going to take three points off. Leave three points. Shape develops pretty quick. Okay, my block, either I, I splintered a little bit, I had a little bit of a little bit of an internal. Is that where it came from? Good catch. <laughs> I didn't notice that when I was when I put that block up here. So uh, 
I guess we're going to have to start issuing safety equipment to all, uh, all attendees. Okay, so you can see in this block, I've got just a very small flat spot right here. I didn't bring a marker. Yes, I did. You can see a very small flat spot right here that's native wood. You see a little bit larger flat spot right here that's native wood. And I have a medium-sized flat spot right there that's medium wood. What does that mean? It means I didn't get the block perfectly square. That means I didn't get the block perfectly centered. It means I need to cut a little bit more to make the shape balance, okay? I'm also going to go a little deeper. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and pull this point and this point. I'm going to pull them uphill to actually make my point right here. So I'm actually going to bring make the bowl a little smaller, uh, make it a little smaller. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll put a we'll kind of put a bead on it. We'll kind of roll this over, so it, so the the lip of it will look kind of like the base did on that little uh, lantern I passed around. Okay, everybody good with that? Everybody want to see that? Show a hand. That look good. Okay, yeah. Side of bacon for everybody. <laughs> This is a green wood. Okay, I'm really past that, that burr now, that, that little inclusion. So I've got my point brought up to here. You see, all I've done by, by bringing that bead around is I'm walking that point down this edge or up this edge, okay? And that's the kind of the beauty of this is you don't necessarily have to work exactly to the corner of the cube. You can bring those, you can roll those edges in. You can swing those edges out. All you're going to be doing is working up and down this line as you move those points, okay? I'm going to smooth that just a little bit. The famous last words, one more cut. Excuse me just a minute. Beg your pardon? I'm crying over that pig. Okay, I don't have the tail stock on there anymore, so out of safety, I want to check the tension on my chucks. I'm not trying to save any of this right now. I'm going to do a lot of hogging, a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm doing an aggressive cut. 
Uh, not really trying to get a finished cut on any of this just yet. Okay, kind of buggered up the tenon. That's why I said I was trying to, when you're doing this in a demo and you're trying to be aggressive and you're trying to show how things are done on a time basis, trying to do a little fast, trying to get a little aggressive, okay? I got a little bit too aggressive and you saw what happened, okay? But I think you can see just in this, the development of the shape and I've left three points. The other three points were out here half the distance between these points. I removed them, they came off quick and easy, right? Uh, I should have left this in the jaws, should have left it supported and done at least, you know, pulled this down to uh, a much smaller shaft, okay? I got ahead of myself, okay? You people scare me. No. <laughs> so, uh, I hope nobody got hurt in the front row. hope nobody got hurt in the back row, okay? But I should have left the live center in place. I should have left that stability up here. I should have done the heavy hogging with support on it, okay? Again, I have not been turning for three years yet, okay? I am still learning. I think the people that have been turning for 30 years in here are still learning, okay? So... Uh, We've all made mistakes, okay? I don't know how many of you made mistakes in front of 50 people, but I'm one of them, okay? So uh, bear with me. Uh, I'm going to move on, and we're going to go ahead and jump to a six-pointed vessel, okay? Everybody, anybody got any questions on how three points develop? I probably could. Uh, I would probably try to figure out how to chuck it and cut a new tenon in it, uh, take a Morse bit or something and, and put a, a reverse tenon on it or something. Yes, I can, that can still be saved, okay? Screw chuck. Screw chuck. The, again, the biggest problem is going to be trying to recreate the center axis. Okay, if I don't get it dead center, it's going to want to vibrate a little to start with. It's going to throw my points off. And when I put it up on the shelf or I put it upside down, it's not, it's, it's not going to sit. One of the points is going to be a little longer than the other. Okay? That's the only problem with trying to get this thing rechucked. Okay? We just put this on our bandsaw, we cut it, pitch, roll, yaw, brought it off, and presto, changeo. We have a block. Okay, that's a six inch cube box shelter. I've already gone through cutting a tenon on it. Just exactly the way we did with the rubber chucky. I had it in the rubber chucky. I used the rubber chucky to size the tenon. I actually did it on both sides. I, I cut this end off. I put a Morse bit in it, and uh, a Forstner bit, pardon me, and I drilled a hole. So, again, compliments of George Freeman. George is a great guy. I don't get a hear here on that. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. And since this is a six-inch block versus a four or five-inch block, like I had earlier, I did make my tin a little larger. Okay. I'm sorry 
For those of you that like the absolute conventional wisdom of if you have a 50 millimeter jaw, you cut a 50 millimeter tenon and you get line contact all the way around it, I respect you for that. I appreciate that. I don't prescribe to that. Okay. Beg your pardon? Two inch. two inch, yeah. Two inch, 50 millimeter, two inch. Uh, if my block's bigger, I make a bigger tenon, okay? And you can see that my jaws do not close to a perfect circle around this tenon. Now, I and I'm saying I respect you for if you prescribe to that method, I respect you. The chances of you getting a perfect tenon so that you get perfect contact all the way around is little to none. You're either going to get four points of contact or you're going to get eight points of contact. That's the way I look at it. Okay. From a mechanical engineering point of view, if I've got two points of contact and I spread those points of contact out, I have more torque capability on that than I do putting them in here close. If you don't believe it, give your grandson a baseball bat, tell him to put his hands together and try to jerk it away from him. You can. Tell him to put his in, hands on the ends of that baseball bat and you grab the center and try to jerk it away from him. It's much tougher. Okay. I'm just saying if you critique my work, which I invite you to do, that's one of the nice, one of the flaws of being a demonstrator is you're opening yourself up. I'm up here uh, showing you the way I do it. I'm not saying it's perfect. It's not absolute. It's the way I prefer to do it. And I've had good luck with it just until the piece just jumped out of the chuck, okay? <laughs> but that was because I cut exactly a 50 millimeter, okay? Okay, what did I do with that screwdriver? Did I give that screwdriver back to you? I'm sorry. I should have kept it. <clears throat> okay, I have used the Forstner bit. I think it's an inch and, a, or inch and three quarter Forstner bit to start a hole. I drilled it to just past these points. Wasn't trying to go all the way through. I didn't know what I was going to do on the bottom yet. I just tried to give myself some, some liberty. I do want to stabilize this. I don't want to make the mistake I just made on that last block. I do want to stabilize both the, the drive and the live center. I'm going to do that with a cone. This is a rubber chucky cone versus the, uh, the live center cone, okay? Either one will work, okay? Rhonda, did you hear about the new restaurant on the moon? Great food. No atmosphere. Okay, we're chucked up. We're, we're past our mistake we made on the last block. I now have it chucked and secured on both sides. Turn the RPM down a little bit. That's 900 RPM, running pretty true. 
just a little bit of rattle in it. I think that's really my live center. All right, now we've got six points flying at us. When you guys are working at home, do you ever have gouges just walk off? All the time, I think I think somebody needs to come up with an RFID indicator. You know, you can put in the put in the handle of your your gouges and then uh, use a cell phone app to find them. All right, we want to leave all six points now. Very much intermittent cut. I'm only cutting one third of the time now. See how that shape's starting to develop? Comes together pretty quick. Okay. It's like kind of like a sine cosine wave or something going on there. I use a fairly hefty tool, especially with the bigger blocks. You can see the way my my tool rest is positioned right now. It's basically positioned parallel with the ways of the lathe. So I've got a lot of overhung distance on my gouge going in to try to develop that center body, that center sphere, trying to get down to that solid wood. You don't want to use too small of a chisel. I've got one sitting at home right now that the chisel's over there and the handle's over here, okay? That overhung load will snap the body of your gouge if you're not careful, okay? You get too aggressive, you start feeding it in, you get too heavy, of, too hard of a wood, you will snap that, okay? just now have it down to a solid round on the inside okay you can see an ellipsoid uh, an elliptical shape parabolic shape whatever you want to call it is developing on these wings okay you see I, I've got a little bit you can see the shape I got a sharpie Note to self, take Sharpie to SWAT. Okay, that may be dark enough. Okay, as this shape develops, you'll see that this starts to create a fairly smooth line. Now, when you first start, you can see this right here is still kind of what I'll call a bulbous, uh, bulbous shape to it. Okay, that goes back. Okay. So when you start, you'll have this, this is not the shape you want. You see how this is discontinuous, how this shape is fairly smooth coming in here. And if I continue to smooth it out, I want to bring that shape 
in a little bit more and get rid of this uh, this bulb. So I'm going to be reducing the center of that just a little bit more. I want to move in just as close as I can on this. Got a little flat spot on these points still. So I haven't gone all the way out to the points yet. I'll clean those up as we move along. I'm just trying to get the basic shape of that center body right now. Any questions? Everybody awake? If you're a one-handed cutter, if you only cut right-handed, this gets a little bit more difficult. You can see I've switched hand to hand and worked back, back and forth. Keep note of which side of the tool rest I keep my hands. If you do a lot of finial work, a lot of skew work, and you like to put your hand behind the part and support the tool sitting on it, this will break you of that habit. Okay, you'll see now this edge is a little bit more uniform, a little bit more of a sweeping, sweeping arc. This side, again, by virtue of the cube not being quite square, you can see I've got a sweeping arc, and then it, it, it gets a, a change in shape right here at these two points. Okay, so I still need to bring this down a little bit. The more I bring this down, the more it'll make this arc smoother. Okay, you can see I still have that pin, that pin mark.
Let's see what it looks like now. Still got a little bit of the hump there. This side's really looking good. And a little bit of tear out. That's one of the things about working in these cubes is you will have tear out. You, there is no, you are doing side grain, end grain cutting. You're, you're going everywhere on the grain, okay? You will have tear out, uh, especially when you get into some of the harder woods, the cherries, the walnuts. You'll start getting tear out on these points. CA glue becomes your friend. Coat those things, soak them, uh, you know, try to keep that chip out, that tear out from tearing up your bowl. Uh, you start getting those, these edges kind of thin and you get some good shapes, you get some good appearance to it. And all of a sudden you get, you know, you knock a point off and you're just beside yourself on how am I going to, you know, come back and fill that with a mineral or with a plastic or epoxy or resin or something. And you spend more time trying to figure out how to repair than uh, how to make your shape look good to start with. So um, it's a learning curve, okay? I'm going to move on. I'm, I'm not going to try to shape the center too much right now. I'm going to go ahead and move to the top of the bowl, the top of the hollow form. Since I have put, used the Forstner bit to cut, uh, cut a hole in the center, it is lending itself you know, I'm, I'm trying to make a hollow form out of it, not, a, not an open vessel. After yesterday when that storm blew overhead, I hear that camera turning and I want to jump, so. A lot of intermittent cut, cutting a lot of air. Again, I'm using a heavy tool, using a 5 8 inch gouge. I'll go to a half inch gouge later when I get down to the point that I can, when I'm getting closer to solid wood, I have less intermittent cut, I can move the tool rest a little closer, don't have as much overhung. I think you can see how it's starting to develop. What I'm trying to do is I develop these wings. I don't want to develop the top of the body too much yet. I want to get the wings developed because if I develop the top of the dome too much and I have big, fat, long wings, I've got to thin those down to make them pleasing. So I've got to work my way, you know, from the outboard edge in. And so I want to work on those wings a little bit to try to get them about the thickness I want to get to. And then I'll blend them into the body later. 
Okay, now what I'm trying to do is as I follow this, I can see this pattern. I can see this turning. I got a phantom here, and I'm trying to bring this edge parallel to this edge. And once I get down uh, to have this just about round in here, I get rid of these flats, I'm going to try to bring these two, these two lines parallel to each other. You can see right now they're starting to diverge and move out. I've got to bring this edge in some more, and I've got to bring it down some more. Corey, is the cameraman keeping up with me? Okay. I don't know if I need to slow down or... Go to a spindle gouge for a little bit. See how close my knuckles get into that uh, that chucky? It's kind of like why I like using the rubber chucky. It's not quite as aggressive on the skin. Yeah. <laughs> Right now, I've got a really, I've got a pretty nice edge on the inside here. I've cut it down where I actually have just a little bit of relief between the the sphere of the bowl and the lip of the wing. Okay. Now, this is another area that the closer you get your cube to square, the more uniform everything's going to be. If I look at this edge right here, I look at this edge right here. Good definition. Look at this edge right here, it's barely cut in, okay? So in order to balance that, I'm going to cut in a little bit deeper because this has got an eighth of an inch, an eighth of an inch, and nothing. That's pretty descriptive, or that's pretty, that looks like an error, okay? So I'm going to try to cut this one down so that when I look at a quarter, a quarter, and an eighth, it's not so obvious that the block was out of square to start with. The other thing you can do is once you're done, you can always take it to a belt sander and take that, take that edge off, okay? Well, we don't have a belt sander, so. What's that? Well, <laughs> this is the Hunt County Turner's Club, not Sanders Club, okay?
The other nice thing about coming to see me tonight, rather than seeing me at SWAT, is all you've had to pay is your dues to come see me tonight. Okay, so you're getting much better return on your money tonight than that you will at SWAT, okay? Uh, I'm going to call that uh, my final cut of the this part of the bowl. I'll probably do some more cleanup here when I try to figure out what I want to do on the top. If I'm going to put a bead or put a little relief on it or embellishment or something and how I'm going to hollow it. Okay, we're not going to hollow tonight. Again, this is a process to show you how to develop the shape, how to develop the outside, how to develop a smooth profile. What I want to do next is I want to, I want to work on this inner edge and I want to make it blend so that this edge and this edge looks like a continuous edge with a point or a plane propagating perpendicular to that okay so we're going to work on this area now try to get that uh, uh, cut back down to where it blends more smoothly Again, back on tear out and uh, and in grain, you got to do some sanding on this. Okay, uh, there are many areas of this you can do some sanding with the part turning. Other areas you've got to subscribe to the Keith Gottschall method of sanding with the lathe on its absolute slowest speed. Stopped. Again, this is a little tricky. I'm back to the half inch and I'm overhung quite a bit because I'm away from those points. I don't want to take anything too terribly aggressive here. I'm watching my shadow, I'm watching my phantom on this side as it spins around, I can see, uh, I can see that edge I'm trying to mate. That chatter means I've got a lot of overhung tool. too bad Okay, if I keep going, I'm going to have kind of a small, small diameter up here at the top wing. My bowl, my hollow form is looking kind of like an old smudge pot. Remember the old black 
kerosene lanterns they used to put in the streets, uh, parade routes or whatever. Uh, probably not the most aesthetic uh, look and shape. I probably, again, this is one of the design considerations. You want to figure out where that sphere is within the wings. If you're going to make the, the uh, bottom wings be the feet, you almost need to shift that sphere uphill or undercut the bottom. And then when you start hollowing it, keep in mind you've got a concave bottom or you'll make it a funnel. Funnel is when the OD and the ID equal each other, right? So, I forgot what tool I got. Got a little bit of a undercut right here. I need to clean this wing up just a little bit. That box elder does cut pretty smooth. The uh, the best wood I've ever done when that when those samples went around that holly, that was the smoothest, sweet and sweetest cutting wood. I was sending curls off of it. I hated to stop cutting that one. It almost. <laughs> Made it a thimble. <laughs> okay, now I'm just going to work on the bottom a little bit. I'm going to try to make the bottom basically try to complement uh, the top shape. I've already got the, uh, the, the wing shape is already defined by the center cut. I'm just going to try to follow that same, uh, that same path. See what we can come up with here.
How many of you have ever seen Eric Lofstrom? He has, uh, you know, he has exercises and uh, and gets you working, working the chisel, working the skew. It's a, it's a good exercise. I try to, especially after I get a catch, I went, hmm, probably if I'd have been a little lighter on my feet and a little lighter with the chisel, I wouldn't have had that happen. Trying to follow that phantom image of the front. Look at where my, my chisel is relative to the motor body. I had the, I've had the same problem getting over here, trying to get in the live center. The, uh, uh, those will get in the way. You gotta sometimes uh, uh, figure a way to work around it. You have too much, too much bevel too much arc in your piece, it just becomes more and more challenging to get in and, and uh, try to cut those. I come in a lot of time with a straight skew and work on these corners. Along with the Eric Lofstrom exercises, they've come out with a new exercise for arm strength and, and upper body. And uh, you find a good place to stand, your, your feet about shoulder length apart. You put a one pound potato sack in each hand, you hold your arms out for two minutes. You work up for a week doing that. When you get comfortable with that, you shift to a five pound potato sack. You hold it out for two minutes. That takes a little longer to get used to. After you finish that, you take a 10, 10 pound potato sack and hold it out as long as you can. Once you've mastered that, you put a potato in each sack. The nice thing about SWAT is you pay for the demo, you don't pay for the jokes. Okay, with that, I was trying to bring the I was, I was trying to bring the bottom edge in parallel to the upper edge. Need to do a little bit more work on that. Need to bring that down. Okay. Ultimately, I will slide the tailstock away. I will move my uh, tool rest out here. I'll come in with my boring bar or my my hook tool and do my hollowing. I will then uh, leave myself enough throat, enough depth here that I will turn it around and reverse chuck it uh, using this as a mortise type mount and I will finish the bottom, okay? Uh, if I haven't finished the top or if I've left some marks on the top when I do that, I'll turn it around again, I'll vacuum chuck it and try to turn and sand this this top off uh, to clean it up or I'll just take my uh, my Dremel tool and my grinder and and dress it up okay so I had an uncle up in Arkansas got in a farming accident and got caught in a plow and it took his arm off at the shoulder and they couldn't get him to the hospital in time the nearest medical person was actually a veterinarian so they took him to the vet and the vet sewed his arm back on him 
And the next week at the cafe, they said, hey, Vern, how'd Doc Smith do it at, at sewing your arm back on? He goes, I give him two thumbs up. <laughs> so if you like today's demo, give me two thumbs up. <laughs> I hope to see you. I hope to see you at SWAT. Again, I am looking to try to, I'm not going to say perfect this, uh, but I do appreciate your comments and your input on today's demo. If you liked it, please tell Donna. Uh, please tell George. Um, I've got part two of this demo. I'll come back and show you next year. A uh, little bit different approach to it. But thank you very much. If you guys want any pine, elm, oak, uh, anywhere in Longview, uh, you know, again, thank you very much. You've been a great crowd.